what are the top IAS 16 mistakes you need to avoid in order for you to understand this fundamental accounting standard. In this video, I'm going to be sharing with you seven key mistakes that you have to avoid in order for you to understand this fundamental accounting standard in your financial reporting or corporate reporting examination on your journey to become a certified chartered accountant or a chartered accountant. Remember that IAS 16 is one of the fundamental accounting standards that you need to know about if you are going into the examination for any financial reporting or corporate reporting exam. But there are various mistakes that students ignore that they don't pay attention to and in respect of the number of questions you solve, some of these mistakes still linger around and it ends up affecting you in the examination. And so I'm sharing with you seven key mistakes that you need to avoid and explain the concepts to you so you can go to the exam or write the exam with confidence and pass the examination. Mistake number one is incorrect initial measurement. Many students miss the initial measurement of the asset. In accordance with IAS 16, the initial cost shall be the purchase's cost plus all other directly attributable costs incurred in bringing the assets to its present use. And so right from the word go, some people miss the calculation of the initial measurement. Note that if your initial measurement is wrong, then suddenly everything else is going to be wrong. So you have to ask yourself, okay, if I want to determine the initial cost of the asset, what are the directly attributable costs incurred in bringing the asset to its present use? And the trap here is that there are certain costs that you may see in the question which may look like cost necessary to bring the asset to its present use, but they are not supposed to be included in the initial cost of the asset. Something like feasibility study. Feasibility study for the construction of an office building is an expenses must be written off in the profit or loss account for the year that it is incurred. Now, this is the misconception. Some people are like, ah, the feasibility study is necessary, then we can now build. And so in that case, let's include in the initial cost of the head office, the feasibility study. No. Feasibility study is like research expenses. And in accordance with IAS 38, all research expenses must be written off in the profit or loss account in the year that they are incurred. Another thing is architect's fee. For architect fee that is qualified, it will be included in the initial cost of the asset because we need the architectural drawings to be able to then build. Then things like commissioning cost, we don't need that because whether the asset is commissioned or not, it is ready for its intended use. Things like training of employees. People think that, yes, without the employees being trained, the assets cannot be used. No, the asset is ready for its intended use, whether you train the people or not. So training of staff can not also be included in the initial cost of the asset. It will be written off in the profit or loss account. So this is one of the key mistakes that you need to make sure you avoid the initial measurement of the asset. It is the purchases cost or the manufacturing cost plus all other directly attributable costs incurred in bringing the assets to its present use and excludes staff training cost, commissioning cost, feasibility study and any other non-directly attributable cost that is incurred. The second mistake that you need to avoid in IAS 16 is improper depreciation. Many people screw up with the calculation of the depreciation. This is the subsequent measurement of the asset. Now, on subsequent measurement of the asset, it is important to understand how the depreciation is done. Now, especially when we are dealing with a straight line method, with a straight line method, the depreciation charge is going to be the cost of the asset minus the square value divided by the economic use for life of the asset. If it is less than one, then we're going to be doing X over 12, where the X represents the period from the initial measurement to the year ended. Now, the error that some people commit here is that when they are calculating the current amount of the asset, they will subtract the square value from the initial measurement, then they will calculate the depreciation and subtract that as well. So it means that in the determination of the current amount, they are subtracting the square value, subtracting the depreciation for the year in arriving at the current amount. No, that is not how we deal with straight line depreciation and square value issue. 
The way you deal with it is that you bring your initial cost, then you less your depreciation. The scrap value will be used only in the calculation of the depreciation. It doesn't affect the actual carrying amount of the asset. So you don't bring it as an absolute figure. That is something that you need to understand. Then reducing balance basis. Remember that on reducing balance basis, you are calculating depreciation using the carrying amount of the asset. So as the year goes by, the depreciation charge also reduces. But these are not the only two methods of depreciation. We can depreciate assets using the total production units on the asset. We can depreciate the asset using the number of hours expected to be used by the asset. So it is important you know the method of depreciation that is applicable and how to do the calculation. If we are using the production unit or the machine hours available, then what you have to do is to calculate the depreciation rate per unit if we are in the production unit or depreciation rate per machine hour if we are using the machine hours. In that case, it will be the initial cost of the asset divided by the total production unit over the economic useful life of the asset. Then that gives you the depreciation rate per unit. Once you have the depreciation rate per unit, you can now multiply that by the units produced for the year ended under review to be able to get your depreciation figure. So these are a number of things that we need to understand when it comes to dealing with the methods of depreciation on the subsequent measurement of the asset. The third error that you need to avoid is misjudging the residual value of the asset and the economic useful life of the asset. This is linked with the second error that I spoke about because some people misinterpret and they are not able to determine accurately that okay this is the economic useful life of the asset after the year ended under review it has been used for this number of years and so now we are left with this number of years that's a problem that students have and it is important you avoid that error if you are going to pass the examination and have a solid understanding in IAS 16, property, plant, and equipment. The fourth error that you need to avoid when it comes to IAS 16 is ignoring impairment. You have to understand that when it comes to the subsequent measurement of the assets, some accounting standards are going to be coming to town, and one of these accounting standards will be IAS 36, impairment of assets. And so sometimes, depending on the way the question has been drafted, we need to look at the impairment measurement or better still, the assets may be revalued. And when we revalue the asset and we realize that the revalued amount is less than the carrying amount of the asset, then suddenly we say revaluation loss, which sometimes can synonymous be said as impairment of the asset and that must be recognized in the profit or loss account. But there is a, an impairment test that may be carried out based on the context of the question. And again, in accordance with IAS 36, an asset is said to have suffered an impairment when the carrying amount of the asset exceeds the recoverable amount. So if we look at the asset, the carrying amount, and we are giving the uh, net realizable value or we are giving the value in use, then quickly you have to know that I need to test for impairment because sometimes the examiner will just say, explain how this will be accounted for in the financial statement of the entity. So you have to know how to deal with this and know where you are supposed to test for impairment and where impairment is not needed. That is another error you must avoid in order for you to understand IAS 16.